Whilst today I don't own Apple hardware, I have long in the past, like during the Snow Leopard days, I have been keeping an eye on the Asahi Linux project from basically the very start. The project to get Linux running on the Apple Silicon Max. I remember when this all started and just getting it to boot was really impressive. And a lot of people were very skeptical about like where this project was gonna go. Uh, there's no way they're gonna get like graphics working. They got basic graphics working. Oh, uh, there's no way they'll get a full desktop running. They got a full desktop running. Oh, uh, there's no way we're gonna have games running even if they're CPU rendered. CPU rendered games happened and it just keeps getting better and better and better and eventually we got to fully reverse engineered GPU drivers and I remember the skepticism that people had about this ever happening. Oh, there's no way we're gonna have proper GPU drivers for this thing. But then it happened. And that was the last time I'd cover this project back in May. Vulcan 1.3 on the M1 in one month. And anybody who thought this was going to be the end was absolutely delusional. How could you have seen the progress of this project and thought it wasn't going to get better? And it got better. AAA Gaming on Asahi Linux. Whilst back in May this was possible, these drivers were very far from ready, this was not yet released to end users, and wasn't really intended for anyone besides developers to actually use. Now it's a bit different. Gaming on Linux on M1 is here. We're thrilled to release our RC Game Playing Toolkit, which integrates our Vulkan 1.3 drivers with x86 emulation and Windows compatibility, plus a bonus conformant OpenCL 3.0 driver. Asahi Linux now ships the only conformant OpenGL, OpenCL, and Vulkan drivers for this hardware. Now at the end of the day, due to this still being Linux gaming, a lot of the stack is what you're probably already familiar with. We use Wine or Proton, which translates Windows to Linux. DXVK for DirectX 11 and before, and VKD3D Proton for DX12, which translates DX12 to Vulkan. But also, this isn't an x86-64 system, so we also need to have FEX. This emulates x86 on ARM. Now, you may recall this from the recent video I did on the thing that Valve is possibly maybe working on behind the scenes with getting Linux games running on ARM-based hardware, probably for an upcoming VR headset. And for normal, regular ARM hardware, this would probably be fine. But don't forget, we're not dealing with normal, regular ARM hardware, we're dealing with Apple's ARM hardware, the Apple M chips, so they have to do something that make things just a little bit more annoying. There's one curveball, page size. Operating systems allocate memory in fixed size pages, basically contiguous chunks of memory that are assigned to the thing that wants the memory. If an application expects smaller pages than the system uses, they will break due to insufficient alignment of allocations. That's a problem x86 expects 4k pages but Apple's system uses 16k pages. While Linux can't mix page sizes between processors, it can virtualize another ARM Linux kernel with a different page size. So we run games inside a tiny virtual machine using MUVM. Now if you've not heard of this virtual machine, it makes a lot of sense. This came specifically out of the Asahi Linux project. Then all you do is pass the devices like the GPU and game controllers and because the Apple hardware is very locked down, you know exactly what the GPU is going to be, so passing that through is quite simple. The hardware is then happy because the system is 16K, the game is happy because the virtual machine is 4K, and you're happy because you can play Fallout 4, or for that matter, basically anything else you want to play. Now do keep in mind, when play is being said here, this is not without performance costs. This system is not perfectly optimized yet. But your options are, it works, but it might be a little bit slow, or it don't work at all. Works, don't work. I know which one I prefer. 
Um, you can do optimizations as you go, and as we've seen before, this project is only getting better and better and better. With drivers that are fully conformant, you can then optimize them and make them quicker. But again, the project isn't done here. Now, speaking of not being done in issues, there are some things that are a problem that aren't because of the software not being done, but are instead inflicted by the hardware itself, because this is hardware made for a very specific purpose, for the context it is being used under macOS. So, taking that to something that is not macOS, when it is hardware specifically made for it, there's gonna be some interesting assumptions. Firstly, we have tessellation. This enables games like The Witcher 3 to generate geometry. Tessellation is the idea of taking an object and then breaking it down into a structure that is more suitable for rendering. The M1 has hardware tessellation, but it is too limited for DirectX, Vulkan, or OpenGL. We must instead tessellate with arcane compute shaders as detailed in today's talk at XDC 2024. This is a really good talk, gorgeous. and there are other timestamps in here. No, there are no timestamps anywhere. The talk starts around 21-ish minutes. I'll leave a link in the description down below. It is absolutely worth your time. At a high level, the issue with the hardware tessellation is designed entirely around what the Metal API uses, which is the only API that Apple actually cares about. Now, Apple does have a OpenGL implementation. It's an old OpenGL implementation, and it's a non-conformant implementation, but it does exist. And in some cases, it does use the hardware tessellation. So they could use it. The problem is <laughs> a lot of the time it just falls back to software compute because even their implementation doesn't properly support the hardware. Also, there's a few other things with the hardware, which honestly, I'm not sure why they weren't mentioned in the blog post, but were only mentioned in the talk. One of those is points mode. So typically, tessellation shaders generate triangles, but this allows it to generate points instead. It's probably not going to be used that much, but it is part of the spec. And another is iso lines, where instead of the others, it generates lines instead. These can be emulated with annoyance, but can be done through software. The bigger problem is transform feedback and the geometry shaders. Now, transform feedback should be pretty self-explanatory from the name. Geometry shaders are an older, cruder method to generate geometry. Like tessellation, the M1 lacks geometry shader hardware, so we emulate with compute. Is that fast? No, but geometry shaders are slow even on desktop GPUs. They don't need to be fast, just fast enough for games like Ghost Runner. Now, these two can be emulated as well, and this is what is being done in the end. The problem is if they emulate them, they can't do so and also make use of the hardware tessellation. So, basically the solution is just ignore the hardware tessellator because it's too much work to get it to work and have drivers that remain conformant. Because if you enable transform feedback, it shouldn't be changing the results. But because they have a different way of doing it in the hardware tessellator and the software, if they have them both there, it's going to lead to drivers that cannot be conformant. Now, the problem with writing a tessellator is reading the spec is very difficult, and it's arcane, and Alyssa even admits to not really understanding it. However, there is a reference implementation written in C++ from Microsoft. So, all you need to do is take the reference, port it over to the system that you're using, port it over to OpenCLC, and don't break anything when you port it. And this is exactly what Alyssa did. Even people working on this hardware don't really understand everything about it. Now back to the post. Enhanced robustness. Robustness permits an application shaders to access buffers out of bounds without crashing the hardware, which is probably a good thing. In OpenGL and Vulkan, 
out of bounds loads may return arbitrary elements and out of bounds stores may corrupt the buffer. Our OpenGL driver exploits this definition for efficient robustness on the M1. Some games require stronger guarantees. In DirectX, out of bounds loads return zero and out of bounds stores are ignored. I do wonder what led to the difference in the way that these are handled. At least from what I'm seeing from like a surface level here, DirectX's approach seems like a better way to do it rather than corrupting buffers. DXVK therefore requires VXEXT, the Vulkan extension, Robustness 2, a Vulkan extension strengthening robustness. So, the next step for the driver is sparse texturing, which will unlock more DX12 games. The alpha already runs DX12 games that don't require sparse, like Cyberpunk 2077. So, sparse texturing is the idea where, instead of having small, easily digestible textures, you have a giant texture, which is too large to fit into GPU memory, that is then broken down into tiles. I am not a graphics guy. I don't know why you would do this, but it is a thing that can be done. Also, of course, performance. While many games are playable, newer AAA games don't hit 60 FPS yet. Correctness comes first. Performance next. Indie games like Hollow Knight do run full speed. I would be very surprised if by now this didn't run at a reasonable frame rate, because I believe... I believe even back at this point, yeah, even back at this point, a lot of games that were fairly lightweight already ran at 60. Now, whilst there are a lot of developers who are like, optimization, optimization, optimization from the start, don't do anything without thinking about optimization, I do think this is a better approach. Deal with getting the drivers conformant and following the spec first, because what you might realize if you don't do that is, as you're adding more parts of the spec, it undoes the performance gains you had before. So get it right first, and get it good later. Beyond gaming, we're adding general purpose x86 emulation on this stack. For more information, see the FAQ, because games are just applications. There's like nothing really that special about them. They do weird things with graphics sometimes, but at the end of the day, it's all still just software. So most of the stack we see here is basically the exact same thing. This documentation also outlines some of the things they're using to pass around input devices, like HID pipe, also Somalia for Wayland compositor forwarding, and other little things like, of course, Mesa, which is kind of very important for the whole like, having your graphics drivers thing. And of course, this is not just a project by Alyssa or by Asahi Lena. There is a lot of other people who've worked on the project, and this isn't just on Asahi Linux itself, that's also with the Fedora side of things, and all of these other little things that have come together to make the project actually possible. I have no interest in buying Apple Silicon hardware myself, at least at Apple Silicon hardware prices, but as a second-hand device a couple of years down the line, having a project like this that can keep this hardware alive, I know some people's like, oh, but just don't buy Apple hardware to begin with because it just breaks. Having something like this that can revive this hardware and keep it out of e-waste for a little bit longer is always going to be a good thing. But what do you think? Let me know your thoughts down below. Do you care about gaming? Do you think gaming is a waste of time? Or do you waste your time doing it? I would love to know. So if you liked the video, go like the video. And if you really liked the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon, subscribe, sleep, bear, pay, linked in the description down below. That's going to be it for me. And show me those quadruple A games next.